Okay, this is my first time doing this, so I'm going to look at this. But um, welcome to Lecture 1. Uh, today what we're going to talk about is pre-Columbian cultures of North America. Um, and what do I mean by pre-Columbian cultures? Um, and specifically, why am I talking about North America? By pre-Columbian -pre simply means before Columbus. So these are the cultures that existed in North America, um, and we're going to talk about them as they were before Columbus came about. So if you don't know what the term pre-Columbian means, there it is. Um, we're also, we could also talk about uh, pre-Columbian societies through all of the Americas, uh, the Caribbean, uh, South America, but we're just going to focus on those pre-Columbian societies of North America, um, because they're the ones that are most immediate to United States history. We could talk about the great Inca empires, and, um, and, but you've probably already heard about those in your AP World History classes. Um, but so specifically, when we start these uh, lectures, we're going to start you off with the essential question. And the essential question is, uh, we are going to analyze the factors that contributed to the wide variety of social, political, and economic structures of pre-Columbian North American societies. That's kind of a mouthful, but that's okay. Um, why? Well, because this particular essential question uh, ties in with our key concept 1.1, um, which is something you can count on showing up in the AP exam. Alrighty. Now, when we talk about these pre-Columbian uh, pre um, societies, the first thing that has to come to our mind is, well, where did they come from? How did they get there? Uh, we know, we know from our, uh, from our studies of world history that humanity uh, evolved in East Africa. Well, how did human beings get from East Africa all the way to the southern tip of South America? Uh, well, that is the question, isn't it? And in order to answer that question, we have to rewind about 10,000 years ago. Um, 10,000 years ago, the world looked a lot different than it does today. It looks a lot different because, at the time, the, the world was undergoing a, a glacial period, an ice age. Um, and during this ice age, tremendous amounts of water was locked into ice that was actually sitting on the North American continental shelf. Um, that ice that was sitting on that shelf meant that there was actually less uh, uh, water in the oceans, and that meant that our sea levels were lower. Um, these ice sheets extended uh, across the Arctic region, and what is today the Bering Straits that separate uh, Alaska from Siberia was at the time passable land called Beringia. Um, so how did uh, human beings get from uh, from Africa to North America and South America, they walked, for the most part. Um, now, a slow progression, so of course, humanity spreads out throughout most of, throughout the African continent, uh, spreads out throughout Eurasia, um, and finally, over the course of millennia, uh, they find themselves in Siberia, and ultimately cross, uh, cross the Bering uh, cross Beringia into North America. Um, now it appears that there are, were multiple migrations. This was not just one migration of, uh, of people, Asiatic people coming into North America, but multiple uh, migrations of people that were crossing over this, uh, over this land bridge uh, in the Bering Sea and coming into North America. Many of these folks walked some of them actually came in uh, some kind of boat, um, and they were traveling along the Pacific coast and found their way into the interior. Alrighty, um, and this happened over the span of thousands of years. But as of about ten thousand years ago, um, the ice sheets started to recede. Global climates got warmer. These ice sheets receded. The, um, the sea levels rose, the um, continental shelf actually lifted in many cases, and 
the, uh, the land bridge of Beringia ended up getting flooded and became a waterway, which became much more difficult to pass. Not impossible. Um, and some groups did continue to travel into North America, uh, even after the ice sheets had melted away. Um, but for our purposes, this is going to be the, the end of the migration. Now, this first group of uh, this this first group that we want to talk about um, is going to come in in what we would call the Archaic Period. Now, the Archaic Period stretched about uh, from about ten thousand years ago to about twenty five hundred years ago, and uh, these were folks who were very similar to their Eurasian um, to their Eurasian counterparts. Um, but at this point, uh, historians, archaeologists. Uh, look at a, a period of time or a, or a group of people uh, that followed what became what became known as the Clovis tradition. And the Clovis tradition is one that is characterized by its technology. Uh, specifically, it's characterized by its tools, its edged tools. The Clovis had come up with a very unique design, unique anywhere in the world at the time, of... Um, of what we would call the Clovis point. Um, this wasn't just a, a spearhead, although this is an example of a spearhead, but also um, any edged instruments, scrapers, knives, cutters, um, arrowheads, ultimately. Um, and this was really an interesting innovation. Shahira Rivera. Sorry, I didn't want to hear the, uh, the announcement. So um, what made this so important was that this was a very sophisticated technology for the time. Uh, these edges on the spears were, um, were oftentimes almost, I wouldn't say razor sharp, but extremely sharp. Um, but what made this unique was this wedging that they included in their spear point, which allowed them to secure it more uh, effectively to whatever their thrusting instrument was. Um, this would have been made out of uh, obsidian or some kind of flint or what have you. Um, and it became a very important um, tool, a, uh, a, a history-altering tool. Uh, these, uh, these Clovis people um, were oftentimes very, hunt uh, very powerful hunters, very effective hunters. In fact, they may have been a little bit too effective, at least for their time. Um, it was the people of the Clovis tradition that oversaw something that, um, that paleontologists refer to as the Pleistocene overkill. Um, before this time, or, or during this time, if you were a person living in North America at the time, some of the animals that you might find in your backyard include the woolly mammoths, mastodons, dire wolves, giant land sloths, uh, you know, so even horses and camels during this time lived in North America. Um, they no longer live in North America today. Why? Um, at least not naturally in North America. Horses and camels, of course, have been brought over, but that was later on. Um, na native uh, North American horses and camels do not exist. Um, well, why did these, uh, these animals go extinct? Well, it was a combination of changing climate. The, uh, the climate was getting warmer. In many cases, the climate was getting drier. Um, but also, this Clovis innovation, this hunting innovation that allowed uh, human beings, who were now also being driven by climate change, to compete more for, um, for hunting grounds. Um, this is going to drive into extinction about 30 of our large mammal species that, that lived on, uh, in North America, gone for thousands of years. Um, the horse will not be introduced back into North America until Europeans come in about 500 years ago and, re uh, and uh, re recreate kind of the natural uh, horses of North America. Uh, now we're going to talk about some uh, some different cultures today. We're going to focus on these five cultures, and we're going to talk about them relatively quickly. We could talk about more. Uh, these are the five that I'm choosing, but there are, there are plenty others. Uh, Inuit cultures, um, the um, um, the cultures of the Pacific Northwest, 
uh, we could talk about some more, some others here. But, but these are the ones that we, we, we want to focus on here. The Anasazi in the Southwest, the Mesoamerican cultures, the Mississippian cultures in the Mississippi River Valley, and the Algonquin and Iroquoian cultures of the Northwestern forests. So let's start with the Mesoamerican cultures. And um, I want to start by, just by taking a look at, um, at an image of some ruins and, and remains that, that, that exist today. Um, I, and again, these are, uh, these are pretty impressive ruins. Uh, I've had the good fortune of actually visiting these ruins and climbing these stairs and seeing these things up close. Um, they are huge in many cases. And... Um, and what can we learn? What, and when I look at these images, or when I visited this, this uh, place in Tulum, Mexico, um, what were some of the things that I was thinking? What were some assumptions that I could make about these particular cultures based on these ruins that I'm seeing? Um, clearly, these were, pe these were an advanced people. These were not a, a primitive, uh, unsophisticated people, as uh, we make assumptions about. Uh, as our Eurocentric view of history makes these assumptions that the people who lived in North America were without civilization until Europeans came in and introduced learning and, uh, and civilization to them. Uh, this is clearly not the case with these folks. Uh, these folks were a sophisticated people. These, these were people who had an understanding of engineering, design, urban development. These had to have been a, a, a people who were not constrained by the daily quest for food. So it leads me to believe that this was an agricultural uh, civilization. Um, because that allows for a greater number of people uh, to do other things other than providing food, like designing and building these great monuments and these great, these great temples. Um, this was probably a society that was very structured and hierarchical. You had a guy who was in charge, who was directing all of this. And you had middle managers who were overseeing the central part. And you had workers who were doing all the bulwark. Um, so let's take a look at, 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 these, um, at these Mesoamerican cultures. So when we take a look at these Mesoamerican cultures, what we see is the development of, a brand, of another new and innovative technology. And this technology is not a technology that we would think of as when we think of gadgets, uh, but rather this was an agricultural technology, and that would have been the development of this particular crop called maize. Now these guys had other crops, avocado, coca, uh, squash, tomatoes, peppers, all kinds of things that they, that they would, that they, um, that they had, that they were growing. But for the Mesoamericans, this was the yummy stuff, all right? This was their staple crop, maize. It is a very starch rich food, which is a quick source of energy. Um, now, of course, we know uh, this particular crop as corn. Um, Europeans had a different idea of corn. Corn for Europeans was closer to wheat. Um, but this is, and, and of course, if you were living in Mesoamerica, say, 2,000 years ago, your corn didn't look like this. It looked more like a baby corn. Um, but, um, but over the years, as we developed the... Um, the uh, the, the agricultural ability to breed larger and larger forms of, uh, of maize, we get the, the corn that we have today. Um, this, of course, became very important. Now, corn uh, or maize is a very efficient crop, right? You get a lot of it in a relatively small space, which is very important, because if you know anything about Mesoamerica, um, from about 2,000 years ago, even up to today, it's relatively dry. So these were folks who had to, who had to find suitable arable land, usually around, uh, well, always around rivers, uh, so that they could get the necessary water for producing food. So if you have a limited amount of land, you want a crop that you can plant that'll get you a lot of produce uh, within a relatively limited space. So, um, so what, and it's very, one thing that, that's very interesting about this, this time period is, um, when you really stop and think about it, 
it's interesting that farming is going all over the world developed in very arid, dry regions. Why? It could very well be that necessity is the mother of invention, right? Um, it was difficult to get food under those conditions, so if you want to survive in those conditions, you have to figure out how to get food. And one of the ways that you might do that is to farm, to actually start to develop ways of encouraging food to grow in a particular spot, which is agriculture. Um, so these arid cultures uh, made hunting and gathering a little bit difficult, and uh, river valleys are then going to become central places for uh, not only growing food, but ultimately all the things associated with growing food, like getting the food, uh, trading goods for the food, uh, to bringing, uh, bringing other goods in from other areas. These places, these river systems will become a centerpiece of for trade and culture and everything else that comes with it. Um, so as a result of this agricultural, what we might call an agricultural revolution, um, is these surpluses in food from farming is actually going to create an increase in population. You also have, because you have a more efficient food source and a larger population, um, you need a lesser proportion of your population involved in food, in food production and getting food, right? So you don't have like a hunter-gatherer society and a hunter-gatherer society. Everybody in that society has to be dedicated to getting food. Uh, whereas in an agricultural society, you can have a, maybe a large portion of people dedicated to the development and the growing of food, but you also have other people who are free to pursue other things, um, like developing technologies, like being part of a military structure. Um, or being engineers, being, um, you know, so, um, so of course this is also going to lead to increased social complexity. You're going to see the development of social classes where people are, um, are, are in charge and other people are in charge at, to a lesser extent than your middle managers maybe uh, and your working groups. Uh, or your warrior groups, or your slave groups, as we conquer and we use our, um, you know, the military that we develop to defend our food and our stuff, could very easily be used to get other people's food and other people's stuff. Um, so we have this increased social complexity. We also see the rise of urban centers, and this is going to be true all through North America. It is a fallacy. That, um, that the cultures of North America lived in small tribes and teepees. Uh, that was really not the case, except for you know, some, some exceptional circumstances. And urban centers typified North America, just like in Europe during this time, uh, such as the urban center Teotihuacan. Uh, this was a huge city, one of the largest in the world at the time. Um, also, we're looking at a... At a period of, um, of surplus. Uh, surplus food means surplus wealth. Surplus wealth means that you're going to have a tax structure. The guys in charge are going to need to get access to some wealth uh, in order to build these and to provide for these urban centers and provide for the defense of these urban centers. So um, you will see, in fact, the development of empires. Um, for our purposes, probably the most pressing of these empires was the Aztecs that, that developed in, uh, in, southern, in Mexico uh, during this time, southern Mexico during this time. Now, another very interesting group of folks is the Anasazi. The Anasazi were a major culture uh, located in the southwestern United States, in the, what we call the Four Corners now, uh, the meeting of Utah, Colorado, uh, New Mexico, and Arizona. Uh, this is one of my favorite places. Uh, again, I had, a, I had the opportunity to visit, pardon me, visit this, uh, this section here. Uh, this is Mesa Verde uh, in southern Colorado. Uh, and you can kind of tell, again, I want to go through the, the, my, um, my meta-thinking. I'm going to try to talk you through, through the thinking um, that I am going through when I take a look at these, at these particular images. So when I'm looking at this, I'm looking at something very similar to what, we, what the image from Tulum. Uh, this was clearly a sophisticated uh, group of people. I mean, some of these buildings are four or five stories tall. Uh, and... 
I mean, they, they've survived for a thousand years with nobody really tending to them. I mean, these, these are some pretty, pretty impressive structures here. Uh, if you get a chance to visit Mesa Verde, I would definitely recommend it. Um, come on. All right, there we go. Oops. There we go. Um, another uh, amazing place to see uh, is Chaco Canyon uh, in New Mexico. Uh, let me get to that in just a moment. Um, again, the Anasazi, clearly an agricultural, uh, you know, culture. This was a, a culture that was able to uh, get people to spend time building uh, these communities rather than just producing and procuring food. Um, some of the technologies that the Anasazi used, again, these are folks who were living in fairly arid, dry conditions. Uh, so some of the technologies that they're going to use is terraced fields, uh, stepping the fields in such a way to maximize their water use. Uh, the Anasazi also built very complex uh, irrigation systems, canals. Some of these canals stretch for 500 miles. I mean, th th these are very impressive, not primitive cultures at all. Um, now, uh, if you get a chance to go to New Mexico, go to Chaco Canyon, it is awe-inspiring. Right, um, the Chaco Canyon, uh, the Chaco Canyon ruins is the second largest archaeological dig in the world. The only archaeological dig that is bigger than Chaco Canyon is the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. So that puts us in perspective. This is an image from just one small section of the Chaco ruins called Pueblo um, uh, Pueblo Benito. And as you can see, uh, this appears to be a fairly well laid out urban center. Clearly the buildings of, are in disarray. And in fact, a part of the cliff uh, up here, I don't know if you can see it, but a part of the cliff actually collapsed. Uh, you know, um, it's actually in 1960, 1960s sometime. But, um, but you can see, one of the things that you see here are these little circular uh, holes. Uh, these are called kivas. And these kivas were probably uh, ritual centers or religious centers. Of course, um, central to uh, this pueblo here is this, this uh, area right here. This is called the Great Kiva. Um, these, uh, these kivas became the central focus of the community. Again, um, probably an agricultural trading community, although in Chaco Canyon it's hard to tell uh, because there's really, it's, it, there's nothing out there. I mean, it's just dry, nasty desert. Um, but these were some huge urban complexes out there. Um, now, what happened to the Anasazi? Where'd they go? Uh, this, was, this, is not a, uh, this is not a mystery, although some people like to add a little layer of mystery, the people that disappeared. Ooh. Well, it turns out, actually, that um, when you, if you actually get to drive to Chaco Canyon, before you get to the actual canyon lands, you'll, find, you'll be driving through some green, verdant valleys, uh, you know, in New Mexico that are just beautiful, lush. Um, and, well, that's where they went. There was nothing out here. This was all desert. Uh, so they just kind of backed their bags, and they went off to, uh, to live with the, uh, with the Zuni um, and the Pueblo communities out there, it looks like. Um, but um, but it, it appears that what did these guys in, in essence, was a twofold disaster, really. They, they experienced some very severe droughts, and, um, well, those droughts, of course, increased competition for food and resources, and then add on top of that um, an invasion by a group of people called the Athapaskan people. Uh, the Athapaskan people will eventually settle down and become the, uh, the groups that we know as the Navajo and Apache and other southwestern Indian groups, uh, non-Pueblo southwestern Indian group, groups. Um, in fact, there was some research that was done just a, just a few days ago that I was reading about in which uh, they, they determined that about nine out of ten of the uh, of the bodies of the um, of the dead that they've uh, that they've found the preserved bodies that they found from many of these ruins, uh, nine out of ten of them had met a violent death. Um, so uh, things weren't looking pretty good for the Anasazi about a thousand years ago. Or so um, so they're gonna they're gonna pack their bags, they're gonna leave these behind, and they're gonna head off into the. Uh, into other areas, mostly into um, into the more verdant valleys of, uh, of of New Mexico. 
Now, these group, this is a group of, uh, of folks that was really interesting, of course. Um, to give you just an idea, uh, an understanding here of what we're talking about, uh, we talk about mound builders. Well, what's all that impressive about a mound? Who, I can build a mound, right? Well, well let's take a look at, the, at this mound in a, in a place called Cahokia. Right, if you take a look at this mound here, uh, that's a car. That little speck there is a car. So this is not just a mound. This is an impressive engineering feat. Again, uh, an agricultural society, an agricultural uh, uh, culture. Uh, this is an artist rendition of the, uh, of the great mound at Cahokia. Uh, so up on this mound, there was probably your government or your religious centers. Um, the people uh, also lived in smaller mounds. Uh, they lived in huts on smaller mounds. Uh, this is not the teepee dwelling, um, you know, stereotype that we have of native peoples at all. Also, too, one of the most impressive mounds is the um, is the Great Serpent Mound. This is um, this is a huge serpent that was built uh, in and around this time, probably for religious purposes. Um, but we're really not entirely sure why. Uh, let's move along. So this, I mean, think about this. I mean, the Mississippi River Valley and, during, and in this area, if you are living on the Mississippi during this time, or you know, even as relatively recently, um, in a world where you don't have horses uh, to travel around with, um, the Mississippi is a pretty good place to be because it's a great travel corridor. If you travel up the Mississippi, travel up far enough, you get to a, get to a fork, uh, you, head to the, you can head to the east on the Ohio River, you can keep traveling north on the Mississippi, or you can head east, uh, rather west, on the Missouri. Um, and there's a number of other rivers uh, that flow into, into the Mississippi. It's a very impressive uh, river valley. Um, and it may, this area is probably going to be a center of not just agriculture, but also trade. Um, we're going to see maize, <laughs> you know, growing in these Mississippian, in these Mississippian cultures. Um, well, that's an indicator that these are folks who had interactions with the Mesoamerican people, the Anasazi people, um, or, and even the people of the, of the, uh, of the forested northeast. Um, these were folks who, uh, who had access to bows and arrows, uh, which were developed among the people who lived in the Great Plains, uh, who later will become the Sioux and the, and the uh, Comanche, uh, Comanche um, and others like that. Um, Fast-growing maize. Uh, if you're going to grow maize in these areas, um, you want to have maize that's faster growing because it gets cold. Um, flint hose for farming, making it easier to pull the land. I mean, in many of these, these areas, um, the land is relatively rocky and not necessarily easily accessed, but very fertile. Um, so you have an area where, where things are ripe for not just the development of agriculture, but also for travel and trade. Um, again, you're, gonna look, you're looking at some fairly complex societies, uh, societies ruled by chieftains, uh, tribute labor, you would be expected to give a certain amount of your time to the community to build these mounds or to build uh, these dwellings. Uh, these mounds oftentimes had walls around them uh, to protect them, so it gives you an idea that there was warfare, uh, that there was a reason to defend themselves. Um, and again, some huge urban centers. Cahokia was a huge urban center, uh, a rival of anything that you might have seen at, in Europe at that time. Um, well, what happened to these folks? Um, well, again, very much like the Anasazi, maybe even some of the same influences that took out the Anasazi culture um, kind of uh, you know, led to the fall of the Cahokia culture. Uh, well, warfare and climate change. Um, Many of these, you know, Kahoki, which was a huge, um, you know, cultural center uh, during these times of, of harsher uh, circumstances, uh, it made a little bit more sense to break up shop 
and kind of create smaller confederacies. These smaller confederacies will go on to become the Choctaw and the Cherokee and the Chickasaw and some of the other um, uh, Native American tribes that we're more familiar with. And finally, the, oops, stop that, oops, uh oh, no, go back, go back. Ah! Uh, hold on. Oh, my thing is off. Uh, hold on. I'm going to pause. Okay, let's get started again. Um, the, uh, the woodland northeast. Uh, this is going to be a very different kind of a culture from the rest that we've, we've talked about. So if we take a look at this image here, what we see is probably not something that's not quite as grand as the Cahokia or the Anasazi, but still some pretty impressive stuff. Um, you have this, this walled enclosure that kind of spirals around these these long houses. These long houses were called long houses because you know. Um, so uh, so this was this is still a very sophisticated culture. Um, now we're going to talk about two different cultures of this uh, of this woodland northeast. Um, the first being the Iroquois. The Iroquois culture was uh, is one of my favorites. It's a, it's a fascinating culture. Uh, when you stop and think about it. Because the Iroquois, uh, unlike, unlike our experience, uh, especially with European cultures, the Iroquois had what was, what was called a matrilineal family structure. In other words, they traced their lineages through the mother. Um, European Western societies and many other societies tend to trace our lineages through our fathers. You usually have your father's last name. But these were folks who traced their, their, their lineage through the mothers, the matrilineal line. Um, and it was the matriarchs who were largely in charge of these longhouses. Now, the, the men were not weaklings uh, by any stretch of the imagination. These guys were, the, you know, major men became chieftains, uh, although they were, they were, in many cases, answerable to the elder women. Um, they were war chiefs, uh, they, they hunted, um, and in fact, uh, they may have been a little bit too good at the warfare because according to the, uh, the oral traditions that have been passed down, um, you know, they, the Iroquois were experiencing some very significant warfare at the time. Of course, if you looked at that picture that we noticed before, you see those walls. Those walls are defensive fortifications. That's an indicator that these guys didn't necessarily get along with their neighbors. Um, so, of course, according to legend, uh, there was a, a great king by the name of Daganawida, um, uh, and what he did is he got up and he is he blocked out to the sun. Uh, well, probably not. Uh, he was almost if there was a sun being blocked out, it was almost certainly a lunar eclipse um, or a solar eclipse. But either way, uh, Daganawida gets credit for blocking out the sun to demonstrate his power. And then basically he got up and said, hey guys, we can't go along killing each other. Um, we're weakening ourselves. Uh, we're wasting our energies. We could be doing other things. Um, so maybe we should stop doing that. And, um, and he, of course, uh, establishes what is going to become known as the Iroquois Confederacy, a confederacy between uh, these five cultures, the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondagas, Cayugas, and Senecas. Um, and he had a follower. His follower was a, a fellow by the name of Hiawatha. And Hiawatha traveled around the countryside spreading the word of Daganawida. Let's get along. Let's stop fighting. Uh, if you have a problem with somebody or somebody did something wrong to you, accept a payment for it. Uh, you don't have to chop off the guy's head. You can, you can get a few bucks out of him and call it a day. Um, and uh, this, the members of this Iroquois Confederation uh, were not allowed to go to war with each other. Uh, they could go to war with anybody else. I mean, they, they weren't against warfare necessarily, but they were not going to go to warfare with each other. All right? um, what I think is one of the most I impressive features of this, because you've got to understand, when, when uh, Europeans came to, uh, to North America, they encountered this Iroquois Confederacy. It was still around, uh, remained around for a long time. 
Um, and this was a time when in Europe, um, you know, European cultures were held under absolute monarchies. These were, in some cases, brutal uh, dictatorships, uh, hereditary dictatorships, but not the Iroquois. The Iroquois had a system that was a heck of a lot more democratic. Um, they had a representative council that would get together in the spirit of the Longhouse and, um, and make decisions for the Iroquois Confederacy. And very interestingly, um, in European society, women were not allowed anywhere near the political realm. Yeah, we had Queen Elizabeth and stuff like that. But for the most part, women, in any real sense, had no political say whatsoever. But in the Iroquois society, the women were the center of the, of the, uh, of the political life. The women were the ones who chose the representatives, the male representatives, to represent them at the, uh, at the Longhouse Council, the Iroquois Council. So everybody participated in the political process. This was a more democratic process than, uh, than anything we saw in Europe. Uh, and in fact, it was members of the Iroquois nation who uh, actually took part in uh, the forming of American democracy. So a uh, very, very fascinating group of folks. Some of my favorites going on here. Um, also, uh, along in that same area, is a group called the Algonquin. Uh, the Algonquin, now uh, the, different from the, uh, from the Iroquois, the Algonquin uh, were a patrilineal society, uh, relatively small villages. Um, in order to compete with the Iroquois con uh, Confederacy, uh, these guys also kind of had to form their own confederacies. They didn't quite have the tight bonds that the uh, members of the Iroquois Confederacy, this was a very ethnically diverse, uh, representing something like 50 different cultures. Um, we have to understand that during this time, there were probably somewhere along the lines of maybe 500 to 1,000 different cultures living in North America before uh, Columbus came in. So, um, so anyway, now these are some interesting cultures. Uh, we could talk about others, but these were cultures that never developed the wheel, um, never developed a written language. Uh, in, in any real sense, um, you know, and yet had some of these uh, these cultures had advanced mathematics, engineering, uh, astronomy. Uh, they had a very the the eastern woodland had a very poetic uh, oral tradition that was passed on from generation to generation. Many of these stories still surviving to this day. Um, you know, these were impressive, impressive cultures. Um, anyway. Please make sure that you complete the, uh, the self-guided notes that accompany this, uh, this video, and I will see you in class later.